gastronomes, what up? welcome to Dirty Belly, where we take you on a journey as your food goes from dirt to your belly. I am your host, Jeff Sims, a dad who loves to eat and grow. I'm here today with our resident culinarian, Mr. Matthew Gaddis. Hi, that's me. What's up, everybody? And a special shout out to our producer, Will Gray, who is out there floating in the ether. Somewhere in space, uh, he, he was near the space station, but not on it. Uh, that's, that's all I. That's all I can divulge. He's out there wherever all my childhood dreams are. Lost. Oh, in space. buddy. <laughs> <laughs> no, now I've got adult dreams, like taking a nap. You know. So. Will bring my dreams back when you get back. Much easier. To, much easier to realize. <laughs> How you doing, Matt? Dude, I'm doing fantastic. I've uh, I've had what experts might call a week. Uh, oh, good. And yeah, yeah, but you I'm got uh, pants on. I did, I did put pants on, even though this is a pantsless media uh, experience. Uh, I, I put the pants on for peace of mind, so all of you can know that I am indeed wearing pants. I'm gonna leave my pants situation as a mystery, so you the the audience will just have to guess. Nice. I'm going. Uh, I'm going. Uh, hearts on a thong. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, you had a week. I had a week. I've been very busy this week. I've been doing a lot of gardening, getting things ready. Um, this is the time of year where if you're a gardener, you just don't have enough time in the day to get done everything you want to do. And that's kind of how I'm feeling these days. Um, I've been shoveling manure recently, which is not as terrible as it sounds. I don't know if I buy that. It sounds pretty, pretty terrible. Yeah. It's, you know, I expected it to be smellier. <laughs> why doesn't this poop smell so bad yeah i was like there's something wrong with this poop man what's going on here <laughs> this poop smells like dirt <laughs> I, i'm taking it back yeah you're taking you're taking a loss on that poop man you gotta get your money back yeah i don't know if they'll take returns but you know i mean I, how do you do a return on free poop i don't know if i can go down that road yeah, let's not, you know, let's not, you know. <laughs> this is about, about, this is about food, not poop. It turns into poop, but that's later. Yeah. You know, I don't want to tell everybody that poop goes into most of the stuff that you eat, but it does. So um, a lot of places will make a manure tea and they'll spray that uh, near their crops, uh, which is why we often have E. coli outbreaks. And <laughs> thus starts my and, fast. There and recalls. Um What's the best thing you ate this week, Matt? Oh, brother, it ain't no sloppy Joe this time. I've got a good one. Uh, yeah. So uh, a, a certain person that may be on the chat uh, involving the name of a hammer uh, treated me to a super awesome lunch, uh, a place called Huang Tofu uh, over in West Nashville. And when I tell you it's a deal, it's insane. We had two Bon Mies, uh, a Pandan Flan, and a couple bottles of water for 17 bucks. It's, it was ridiculous. Uh, so I got a grilled pork bun me. What I wanted was the crispy pork, but they were out, which means that's the good one. I've got to go back for that. Mm. Uh, and uh, my, my companion got a tofu lemongrass bun me. Uh, and it was tofu and it was just filthy with lemongrass pulp. It, it was so good. And the, uh, the flan I wanted to touch on, it, it was like a layered jelly situation, but it was made with pandan. Uh, pandan is a leafy seasoning ingredient found in a lot of Eastern cuisine. It's kind of like kind of vanilla, kind of coconut, kind of nutty, uh, and it makes for an incredible uh, dessert seasoning. And honestly, most times you'll find it is in cakes or jellies or something like that. Um, yeah, the place is incredible. If you don't if you don't speak one of the three Vietnamese dialects, then you just have to point to the number on the board, and that's it. That's that's the extent of the communication. But they were that's, so nice. That's a good sign. Oh my God! Yeah, uh, yeah. They they were so nice. Uh, everybody that walked in was smiling. Everybody said hi to us. It, it has super cool like neighborhood feel. Like and we uh, we discovered the place on online, so I know people know about it, but it definitely is a, like an if you know, you know kind of place to stop. So, uh, yeah, uh, if you're in the Nashville area, I highly recommend Huang Tofu. Uh, 
is a uh, h-u-a-n-g tofu uh get just over there ask you how to spell it yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's over in west nashville uh sorry getting a little local here but uh it's right by k and s and key and gang uh lucky bamboo uh there's a lot of cool spots there but yeah check out huang tofu as fast as possible i'm gonna do that that's for sure um and just real quick can um can you kind of for anybody who may not know uh, what a what exactly a bon me is oh uh yeah bon me uh it's actually uh, kind of a product of French colonization in Vietnam. Uh, so that you take uh, uh, local produce and ingredients that are indigenous to Vietnam, and then you put it on uh, a crunchy uh, French baguette. Uh, so typically, uh, and uh, please don't nail me to the wall if I get this wrong, but uh, typically you're looking at a pork pate uh, as well as a little uh, barbecued or grilled pork. Uh, cucumber, cilantro, carrots, jalapeno, uh, and usually a uh, mayonnaise or an aioli kind of spread. Yeah, and they'll pickle those vegetables a lot of times, won't they? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, one, the ones we had were raw, but some of the best ones uh, are definitely pickled. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's delicious. And, you know, we, you know we're not, not a big fan of colonization uh, over here. Uh, you know, that's you know, this is a silly history, but... Uh, uh, sometimes, boy, we get some good stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I, I didn't mean to get off on this tangent, but I, I kind of have to tell this story. My first experience ever with a bon mi, I, I ended up at the uh, Laotian New Year Festival at, at a, a local uh, Buddhist temple here somehow, some way. I ended up there, and this guy was walking around with this giant plastic bag full of these little sandwiches, and he just gave me one because, you know, I was like one of the only white people there. And he's like, here, dude, eat this. And I was like, oh, this is delicious. What is this? He said, it's cat food. <laughs> like, obviously he's messing with me but you know with that pate it kind of looks like cat food you know what i mean so yeah uh, yeah yeah it's a uh, pretty funny story uh he got a he got me good he robbed me up a little bit but good for him <laughs> so. uh best thing i ate this week um uh bacon brisket sandwich i had at a local diner here um the brisket was incredible i mean you know Brisket's one of the harder meats to barbecue properly. Uh, most oh, people, yeah, it can go wrong so fast. Most people's barbecue brisket, let's be honest, is dry. And anytime you get one that's still juicy, I'm in heaven. It's on a nice uh, Texas toast. Uh, it's a couple slices of bacon served with some French fries. Absolutely delicious. Um, and then also all week long, I was making egg white omelets for my family. Um, I believe our producer is sharing a picture of one of my egg white omelets right now. As you can see, I love to slather mine in hot sauce, which is terrible for my heartburn, but I can't help myself. You know, can't that's stop, won't stop. That's why God invented Tums to help me <laughs> with my hot sauce addiction. Uh, Tums came from God. They come from the Tum tree. Okay. Well, good. Yeah. That would be the next week's subject. Okay? Is Tums. I'm not trying to get theological here, but who made the Tum tree? Okay. So. <laughs> Uh, if you know, and we'll, we're going to uh, shout this out later, but you know, we'd like for you guys to share the best thing you eat every week with us, send it to us on any of our social media, which we'll share later. I mean, it's, we're dirty belly. There aren't a lot of dirty belly social medias out there. You can probably find us, um, into today's episode, collard, collard greens, y'all. Hey, there, he said it. <laughs> Gaddis rules everything around me. Whoa. Find, find a better ruler. Uh, what are collard greens? It is a loose leaf cultivar. What it, what exactly does that mean? Um, it just means it's a cultivated plant that is a that is loose leaf, right? The leaves are loose. And what we mean by cultivated plant is that human beings have grown them and then selected the varieties they like, taken the seeds and grown them again, and uh, basically engineered through growth what the plant is today um, it is a part of the cruciferous family which includes cabbage broccoli cauliflower kale brussels sprouts and this one i was actually surprised by i didn't know this was a cabbage type plant but kohlrabi i don't know if everybody's familiar with kohlrabi it's a pretty recent ingredient to the culinary world not a lot of people use it it's kind of like uh when you eat it it's almost like an apple and a potato kind of mixed together i don't know it's it's a uh, yeah, super starchy. Yeah, you're right. That yeah. is surprising. That's a, that's in the uh, the same family. That's uh, but it does have the different. big leaves on top, so I kind of see that. It does have like the cabbage style leaves. Um, it's got that root though. 
Yeah, uh, you know, a collard green is 90% water, 6% carbs, 3% protein, and 1% who knows, right? Um, contains high amounts of vitamin K. So much vitamin K that if you eat too many collard greens, it can actually cause you some issues with because vitamin K uh, is responsible for blood clotting. So you don't want to eat like a gallon of collard greens in a day. It's probably a bad idea. A couple cups is fine, you know. Oh, that sounds uh, like a challenge. Yeah, uh, it's high in calcium, vitamin C, vitamin A, folate, magnesium, potassium, phosphorus, and antioxidants. Um, anything in the cruciferous family in general is going to be really healthy for you. Uh, green vegetables, especially green leafy vegetables. Um, we as Americans don't eat enough of them. And that's probably why we have such poor health in America. Um, it's really good stuff for you. Uh, very healthy. It'll help you lose weight because it will fill you up with not a lot of calories and it will provide you with the nutrients your body really needs to feel good every day. Um, it can, they are known to help prevent cancer, improve bone, eye, digestive, and heart health. Um, and currently, collard greens are widely grown and consumed in Africa, Europe, North, and South America. So there you go. That's what a collard green is. Um, description. I was sorry. Uh, I, I was shocked uh, when we were talking about seasonal ingredients uh, to find out. Like I don't know why I assume collard greens are just eternal, but of course it has a, uh, a season. Uh, but yeah, January through April. So we're right here in the pocket for collard greens. Uh, they're they're a really good cold weather crop uh they're really yeah. resistant to frost and freezes and things like that so uh actually good. And i'll get into this later uh the cold weather is actually good for them yeah they call it grains that have been hit with the frost taste better nice uh when was the first time you ever ate collard greens matt oh man uh i have to I don't remember in particular the first time. Uh, I have to assume it was after I moved to the South. Because, uh, uh, you know, uh, up, up in Indiana, the collard greens are sort of a, uh, you know, meat and three kind of leave it behind ingredient. I don't know if I ever had them up there. But uh, once I got to Tennessee, I, I started experiencing it. And uh, I'm mostly through restaurants. My, my family cooking history uh, doesn't really include collard greens. So uh, it was it was a new thing to me. I think my I think my dad is the one that that first uh, kind of showed me the ropes. He had had them before. So uh, I, I tried some of his sometime uh, one time and uh, he he brought on he brought on my attitude of judgment as far as greens. Uh, uh, I will one thousand percent judge an entire establishment based on the quality of their collard greens. And that's uh, fair. It it because it means attention to detail. Like it's yeah. not collard greens are not the headliner, but if they're seasoned well, if they if they taste good, if they have all the all the little moving parts in there prepared properly, I know somebody in that kitchen cares. So I know probably everything's going to be pretty good. And the worst thing you can do is go into a collard a restaurant and get a collard green and find out that they're gritty because that means they haven't been washing them properly and. Uh -huh. That, that says a lot of bad things about the restaurant. Um, the first time I ever had collards was at my grandparents' house. I was born and raised in the South. My family is from the South. Um, so, you know, collard greens, while not a staple for us, like they are for black Southerners, um, they were a big part of our diet, uh, mostly because they're cheap. They grow easily. And, uh, you know, it's it's something that's kind of handed down. One of the recipes that's handed down generation, generationally, even in my, my family, was our collard greens recipe. Uh, the first time I ever had them, I hated them. Um, kids in general do not like things like this because uh, it looks weird. It has a it, it can have a weird texture to kids. Uh, it has it can have a very strong flavor. Um, it's more of an acquired taste, right? So, um, you know, I probably didn't like collard greens until probably the tenth time I tried them. And that was much later after my first time, because after the first time, I said, you know what, I'm going to skip that bowl. I'm going to skip that bowl. <laughs> well, you, hit on a, you hit on something really interesting. Uh, I think that uh, the inherent bitterness of collard greens is kind of a, kind of a litmus test uh, as to what you're going to be able to tolerate on your palate in general. And my, my feeling about bitterness is it has such a place in food preparation, like it, with without bitter, then you can't understand sweet. You know, with, without evil, there is no good. 
Like you, you have to have that balance in your food, that balance on your palate. It makes everything more interesting. So if, if you're out there making yucky faces about bitter stuff and sour stuff, then, you know, just put, you know, pull your thumb out your ass and eat, eat, eat some collard greens. Sledge it real good says, uh, not opposed to canned veggies, but canned collards are horrendous. Um, I agree. It's not the same. It really isn't. Uh, fresh collards are easy to grow, easy to find. There's no reason to be eating them canned unless I guess you're in the middle of the summer or something and they're just not good around you. Um, Listen, I'll, I'll you, be you just have to really love take. collards to be eating them out of a can. That's all I'm saying. It's not yeah, something that I, you I take eat. from my end, man. I, I, I tolerate canned collard greens. But all, all you got to do is throw a, a, a half bottle of hot sauce in there and I, I'll, I'll eat that. <laughs> You're eating hot sauce, not grains there. That's fair. I'm also <laughs> trash. So, you know, take, take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> all I'm saying is you don't see many people in the South. We do a lot of canning in the South, especially if our garden vegetables. You don't see a lot of people canning their grains. Okay. We can't most of the stuff we grow. You don't see many people canning their grains. I'm just telling you right now, because it's not the same. It really isn't. You um, can pickle uh, collard greens though. Uh, and that's a, things. that's a real treat. Yeah. So I'm going to talk a little bit here about the history of the collard green. Um, it dates back to prehistoric times as a plant. Um, was eaten by dinosaurs. So, you know, one of the fun things I like to do when I'm eating something and why I love the history of food is when I'm eating something, I like to imagine all the people throughout history that have eaten this plant or this meat or whatever it is, this type of dish. And I thought you were going to say you like to pretend you're a dinosaur. Well, that's a cool thing. When you eat collard greens, you can pretend you're a dinosaur, right? You can say dinosaurs ate this. I'm eating this. I'm basically like a dinosaur, right? And this may be a good way to get your kids to try it. You know, dinosaurs eat these, you know? Um, they're native to the Eastern Mediterranean or Asia Minor area. There's, you know, they've they've been eaten for so long and cultivated for so long that it's hard to know exactly where they came from. Um, but we know it's somewhere over there. Um, they've been cultivated by humans for over 2,000 years. And remember what I said earlier about cultivation. What that means is we have been growing them specifically and selecting the breeds that we like and continuing them with their with that seed. And in so breeding in the type of characteristics that we like. And that's what cultivation is. Um, there's evidence that ancient Greeks and Romans both cultivated several types of collards. So you can pretend that you're a Roman soldier. You can pretend you're an ancient, ancient Greek while you're eating your, while you're eating your greens. Um, I prefer <laughs> a Roman soldier, but you know, you do you, you know, I'm not going to judge you. Um, they were first brought to America and this is, uh, you know, a big part of Southern culture and history here, the collard green. Um, and, it was first brought to America in Jamestown, Virginia in the 1600s by the first African slaves. Um, during slavery in the United States, collards were often grown, grown in slave kitchens to supplement the rations that were given by slave owners. They were cooked with leftover scraps such as ham hocks or pig feet, which is very similar to the Southern preparations that you see today. Um, they were used by slaves because the plants could last through the winter and were more heat tolerant than lettuce or spinach so that they would last through the summer as well, right? So uh, traditionally collards are biennial. Most people now grow them as annuals, but you know, they, they could plant a few rows and it would live for a couple of years. It would, they don't take a lot of maintenance, right? It was easy to do. It was easy to, to add a lot of nutrients to their diet, right? And after civil war, destitute white Southerners began to eat them as well because it was cheap and easy to grow right and they learned what black people knew for 200 years before that that they're delicious if you prepare them correctly um, they have come to represent black culture in the south in the united states the collard green is a very important ingredient for black communities um, their recipes for them are generational they're handed down from great grandmas to great grandmas. Okay. All the way back to whenever these families were brought to America. Um, Thelonious Monk, for example, sported a collard green in his lapel as a way to represent African culture when he would play. Um, they were served uh, at Barack Obama's first state dinner, you know, and there are several collard green festivals around the country, which are also black heritage festivals. So, it, you know, because of its place 
in the slave diet. It has, and then it being passed down through the generations in black families. It's, it's a big part of black life. Um, my understanding is you don't go to many black family dinners that don't have collard greens on the table. Uh, Catch me trying to find a collard green festival now. Like I, I didn't know that was a thing. So I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to be finding out how to get to one of those. There, there are a few in the South. There are, um, they're traditionally eaten on new year's day, especially with black eyed peas to gain wealth and prosperity in the new year. And that's the history of collard greens, especially in the Southern United States. And it's a big thing here. I, I don't, I know most of our listeners currently are from the South and, but I think eventually we're hoping to have listeners from all around the world and they're eating around the world, but especially in the U S South, it's a big thing here. And that's why. Speaking of the cultivation of collard greens and what I talk about cultivation, I'm talking about as we grow them, right? As we grow them now, um, they can be grown year round in most climates, but generally they're better to be eaten in colder months. Like I said earlier, it's, it's good when they're hit with frost, a little bit of frost is actually makes them taste better in the summer. When it gets too hot, they get really tough and stringy and they get especially bitter. So they're just hard to eat at that point. They're still edible, but it's not going to be something that you're going to enjoy like a young spring collard. Uh, they are grown from seed, not a bulb or anything like that. They are biennial, which means they usually last at least a couple years, the plants. But today in America, we usually grow them annually uh, because people like to clear out their beds, maybe grow something different there during the summer. It's just easier to do that way. Um, there are perennial breeds, which means they just last indefinitely, right? Um, and they're known as tree collards. And they can be uh, ornamental style plants that you can plant. They're also edible, which is kind of neat, I thought. Oh, yeah, that's some of those have different colors. You know, they have purple tree collards, so you can get some, some a little more variety in your colors, which it can be neat sometimes. They grow about 20 to 36 inches tall. They like full sun. They can stand a little bit of shade, but most vegetables that you eat are going to like a lot of sun. Uh, they like slightly acidic soil. They're hardy in USDA zones from 6 to 11, which is basically the entire United States. And what a USDA zone is is just – it's basically a temperature scale for how low the temperature gets and six to 11, like I said, basically covers from Florida to Maine. So you can pretty much grow them everywhere, um, which is why they were so prominent uh, in and why, why they've been cultivated and eaten for so long, because it's so easy to grow them and uh, too much heat. Isn't going to kill the plant too much cold. Isn't going to kill it either. That makes a lot of sense for, uh, for being a springtime crop, especially in the South. If, if you're in the South, you know, that, I mean, we're in it right now. The temperature fluctuation is insane. So to have something that can hold on and still still be produced in that kind of weather condition is is super important. So of course, of course, it was a it was a viable crop uh, in the south. And it doesn't need a lot of water like some vegetables do. So it it really is one of those plants that you can throw down some seeds, come in and thin it out later, and then you're good. You don't really have to do much work to it. And that's really great if you're trying to grow enough food to su sustain yourself for a year, um, especially something like that that can be an early harvest because most of the best vegetables don't come in until May, June here, um, or even July sometimes. So yeah. it's uh, good. Uh, Matt, let, tell me a little bit about how you would go about pur purchasing and storing your collard greens. Uh, so uh, purchasing, uh, you know, this, so th this is on the, on the assumption that you're not growing yourself. Uh, purchasing things to look out for is you want uh, you want you want to look for broad leaves uh, surrounding the rib that uh, don't have any sign of yellowing. Uh, that's that's a big no-no. You you want them to be crisp but not like cardboard firm, kind of right in the pocket between between a moist leaf and and a, a sheet of drywall. Like it's that that's right what you're looking for. Uh, yeah, uh, definitely. Again, definitely avoid the yellowing and the holes that can that can uh, indicate some poor packaging or poor uh, shipping, which there could be some foodborne illnesses in there. And you, boy, you don't want that coming fresh off of one of those. Uh, uh, one thing to note when you buy your greens, uh, even if they're a little dusty, a little dirty, which is totally natural. Uh, unless you're going to use them immediately, don't wash the greens. Uh, a lot of plants, 
they like their own inherent moisture. They don't like introduced moisture. Uh, uh, consider last week's episode with the mushrooms. Uh, you don't want to wash mushrooms and then store them again. That's going to lead to mold and blight. Same thing with collard greens. If you wash them and then and then seal them up and put them in your fridge, then you're you're going to get wilt. You're going to get uh, just a, a loss of quality. Uh, uh, as far as uh, preparation afterwards, though, um, a lot of people will tell you to uh, cut them thin into ribbons. Uh, I think that's ridiculous. Uh, I like my I like mine chunky. Uh, you do want to remove the leaf from the rib. Uh, a little bit of that top rib is okay. Uh, in fact, I find it super desirable when you get one of those big hunky pieces. Uh, and then I just do I just do a rough chop uh, and throw them into a pot with your with your chosen seasonings. Uh, I'm glad you touched on the ham hock there. It's one of my favorite uses of a ham hock. Uh, typically, mine's uh, my pot will have uh, bacon and a ham hock in it. Uh, plenty of vinegar. Uh, I like to use apple cider vinegar, uh, some brown sugar, a uh, uh, little bit of salt, black pepper. Um, I, this is definitely blasphemous, but uh, I like to put a little soy sauce in my greens. Uh, adds a little uh, punch of umami, something, something a little special. Not enough to taste like soy sauce, but something to give you a little bit of background there. Uh, and then then it's all bets are off when it comes to the hot sauce. Uh, that's that's where my heat comes from. I don't like using red pepper flakes or anything like that. I like I like using specifically crystal hot sauce. And boy, uh, yeah, catch, catch me putting a, a half a gallon in there. Like, <laughs> I like them. I like them spicy. Uh, that being said, there's there's a really fun comparison to uh, Eastern philosophy there, which is uh, kind of why I throw uh, soy sauce into the mix. There is a belief uh, among a lot of Asian cultures that the best dishes uh, will incorporate something from every uh, part of your palate. And that's a really interesting uh, translation into American cooking, especially Southern cooking. So I think most Southerners would agree when you when you get a bite of a green or when you get a bite of a casserole or anything that's been then cooked for a long time, it's got a little sweet, a little salty, a little bitter, a little sour, a little spicy. It gives you that. Ooh, wee. Like that's that that's just the American version of that same philosophy. And I think greens are a perfect vehicle for that to give you to give you every one of those aspects all at once into a nice meaty bite uh, that satisfies your whole palate. Oh, absolutely. And I, I want to go back to the purchasing storage and storage aspect of it. Um, I think the best place to buy any vegetables when they're in season is the local farmer's market. But I want to give you some tips first for going to your local farmer's market. Um, you want to find a local farmer. And I know it sounds silly. Oh, I'm at a farmer's market, right? What, what else is going to be there? You might be shocked to learn that what some people will do to make some money. Um, people will literally buy stuff from Cisco and take it to a farmer's market and sell it if they're allowed to. So you, you need to first learn about your farmer's market, what steps they go to. The farmer's market that I like to use here local, locally to me, I know that the people who run it actually go to the farms and make sure that they're in an at least an adjacent county, if not our county, and that they see the stuff growing there. So that gives me a lot of security that I can walk into this farmer's market and know everything I buy is here, right? If you don't have that, or if you can't find that information about your farmer's market, the best thing to do is talk to the farmer, right? I mean, we've all got a BS meter, right? You can tell when somebody's fluffing you up a little bit when they're, when they're lying to you, I think most times. And, you know, if, and honestly, most people will be honest with you. You know, if you, if you just ask them a direct question, like, where did you grow this? You know, something like that. Most people will say, oh, well, maybe I bought it secondhand or something, you know. it's It can be hard for people to lie sometimes when they're given a direct question, I guess is what I'm saying. And most of the time people just won't ask, so it never it's never broached. But it's yeah. something that you need to know, right, if you want to get the highest quality ingredients. Yeah, and inquiring about your food is, is so important. Like, uh, it, it, seem, it seems natural to me because I've, I, my whole life is around food. But, uh, yeah, ask, ask the questions figure it out if, if you even if you have an idle curiosity about the providence of what you're eating uh, pursue that like it it's going to be interesting uh, or it could be a red flag yeah ask them where's your farm did you grow where's this your there? farm 
Yeah, where is your farm? I want to see it on a map. <laughs> Dad, did you grow this deer? What what variety is this? That, you know, questions like that. And then you can get to know the farmers, which is cool, right? Because farmers are cool people in general. Are you a farmer or did you just buy some suspenders? Yes. Yeah. What's going on here? Are you just wearing the outfit or is this a cosplay? Or <laughs> do you really do the deal? Let me see your fingernails. Are there dirt, is there dirt <laughs> under there? What else do you grow? What what type of ingredients can I expect you to be carrying in different parts of the season? These are all fun questions to ask, and you can learn a lot, really. And a lot of times they may even give you tips if you wanted to grow it yourself on how to grow it. Um, I love also that we're putting farmers on blast right here. Like, you got to come correct. Yeah, you better come correct, farmers. And they will, honestly. A, a good farmers are very passionate about what they do. And if you ask them about it, they actually love talking about it. So Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and they're they're good farmers are great people and they're just good people to know and meet and i i encourage you when you go to the farmer's market don't just be the guy that's like i'll take that right there here's five dollars i'll see you later you know get to try to talk to them get to know them you know um, because it's going to be good for you, you know? oh yeah and, yeah yeah and yeah, please, please everybody do that go and experience the farmer's market and ask those questions i feel like uh, you wouldn't be watching this right now if you didn't have some curiosity about food so if you enjoy this then you know go 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 do it in real life don't don't just watch it go 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 do it not right now wait till we're done but then go uh, another a avenue i like but you're not ever guaranteed what you're going to get but most of the time you will get stuff like collards because they're easy to grow is a, is a local csa which is community supported agriculture which is a local farm which operates through a system where local consumers sign a contract with them for the year and you will pay a certain amount. You can pay it month. You can usually pay it bi-weekly or weekly, or you can pay it in an upfront amount. Obviously, it's like your car insurance. You'll save more if you pay it up front, but it's easier to pay it by the week, right? Uh, but you'll they'll send you a box of produce, or you'll go pick it up. Usually, they have pickup stations around you know your major city or whatever that they're servicing, and you'll you'll go once a week or once every other week, and you'll get a bushel or a half bushel of fresh vegetables and what's cool about that is they'll give you a lot of different stuff it won't just be one thing and you'll get surprising stuff you'll be like man i i've never tried to cook a kohlrabi i don't even know what it is but here it is right sometimes i've gotten stuff in my box that i'm like and i i i was a cook slash chef for 20 years and i would get stuff in my box that i'd have to call them and be like what is this <laughs> like before i try to eat this can you tell me what this is because i'm a little confused right now but it's Ed, that's another great way to get to know your local farmers. And I, I always really enjoy CSA, CSAs. Um, the difficult thing with those is sometimes it's hard to eat all the produce because they do give you a lot. And Yeah, uh, I wanted to. Yeah, I, I, I love that you touched on a CSA. Um, one of the one of the more fascinating times uh, of my culinary career was working at a place called Field in Maine uh, up in Virginia. Uh, they're still kicking. Uh, God bless them. Uh, it, it, one, of, one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. Uh, but we had a produce program that was built around a CSA for a while. So uh, it was really interesting for, to, as a, as a fine dining establishment, as a restaurant, to be held to the produce that we were supplied by that CSA. Uh, it forced us to be more creative. Uh, so you know, we, we couldn't just get the same crop and ride it for an entire season we we were held to what the farmers had available and that forced us out of our box it forced a lot of creativity a lot of interesting dishes uh and we wouldn't have had we wouldn't have had such a rewarding experience if we didn't have that connection to the community and to the farms that our produce were coming from and that's what i love about it is it is a connection to your community especially your agriculture agricultural community and if you're like matt and i and you live near a major city or in a major city there aren't a lot of farms around there aren't a lot of places to go get fresh produce and by supporting these we're continuing growing the food where we live that we eat which is important um it's you know we spend a, we we burn a lot of gasoline moving our food around the country so anything that you can buy local helps with that and it's just great to support support local farms because like i said Good farmers are great people. They really are. And it's they're people that need to be supported in our economies. And it's hard to survive in a big city or near a big city because the, the real estate becomes so valuable that a lot of times you get priced out of the market. And but that's that's what I had for the where to get your collard greens. As for how to store them, um, I usually try to buy them fresh and cook them as soon as I can. 
Yeah, yeah, that's that's the way right there. And that should just, in general, be for all your produce. You really don't want to be holding produce for more than a week in general. Um, you're going to lose a lot of quality that way. The longer stuff sits in your fridge, the less delicious it is. And I, I agree with Matt 100% on you don't want any yellow on your leaves. You definitely don't want anything slimy. Um, you want a good crisp leaf is what you want. As for washing them, um, I, I like to submerge them in a tub of water because they can't they they are near the soil sometimes they can get dirt on them they can be a little gritty submerge the them in a tub of water, water. Right? yeah full bath and i'll i'll bath them twice i'll pull them out drain it spray out all the dirt in my sink put them back in let's do another let's do another dip double dip you know sometimes i got to do with that, that with my son at bath time you get to double dip when he's <laughs> especially dirty and my greens get that too because the last thing i want is grit in my greens nobody likes that you know a little sand in your leeks or your greens uh, no, thank you. Yeah, That's somebody wasn't paying attention. Yeah. Uh, you know, so let's let's talk a little bit about the preparation and cooking of greens. Obviously, Matt already talked a little bit about the cooking and broth method, which is a very popular method here in the South. Um, I think uh, I think touching on slow food uh, is really important there as well. Like, I kind of kind of gave up the goat on uh, on my uh, recipe or loose recipe, but uh, I think s slow food is is really important because uh, you know th this is going to sound hack and everybody said it, but everything is so fast, everything is so go go go. I think it's important to take time with your food. Like my my favorite recipe to prepare ever is short ribs, and that's that's a long process. You cannot rush that. Even if you've got a pressure cooker, you can't. You're not going to take a lot of time off of that. And greens, uh, greens are one of those you know, that's, it's an all day experience, uh, possibly a multi-day experience. Uh, and, and yeah, time is not on your side or it is depending on your frame of mind. Uh, I think, I think taking, taking the time to build those flavors and layer flavors, uh, people, yeah. you can taste it in the end result. Yeah. I've got a couple comments here. I'm going to talk about here. Uh, Allison asks, I saw someone cut them before they washed them. What is y'all's opinion on that? In general, I do not like to cut fruits or vegetables before I wash them because there may be pesticides or something on the outside. And when you cut it, you take that knife blade is going to carry whatever's on the outside through the cut, right? I'd like to wash it before I cut it. I'm not going to put throw somebody in food jail because they cut them before they wash them. But personally, I'm, that's not something that I, I do or approve of. Uh, let's see. There was one more. Oh, I guess I've lost it. Oh, well, sorry, whoever had that comment that I thought was worth talking about that I can't find now. <laughs> uh, getting back, back to in, cooking. Nerd. Oh, no, here it is. Uh, someone said that they wanted to, that they prefer tearing the leaves. I think that's a great way to do it. It gives a very rusty Absolutely. look to tear them instead of cut them. And honestly, if you're doing lettuces, it's actually better to do them that way because the cutting them can actually make them brown faster, whereas tearing them, they'll, they'll last a little bit longer in your fridge if you need to keep them after. Um, so I do like tearing my greens when yeah, I can, but I don't want a very that. precise look. I want a rustic look. I'm definitely tearing instead of cutting. Yeah, that's um, kind of the uh, like the the anti thin ribbon thing that I was talking about earlier. Te tearing is a, that, that's a perfect way to get around that. Now, speaking specifically about the cooked in broth method, which is what most people will think of when they think of uh, southern collard greens and and what most generational recipes will look like. Um, you're generally going to have some sort of seasoning meat. Some people use smoked turkey. Some people use pig's feet. Some people use ham hock. In my family recipe, we use jowl bacon, which is bacon that comes from the, the face area of the pig. And you layer it on a really thin layer along the bottom of the pot. And you stack your greens up on top of that and just a slow simmer, right, with some onions, like, sliced and thrown on top. Most of them are going to include some sort of onion in there some seasoning of some sort i like mike lowry's seasoning no free shout outs though so you know mike um, lowry's seasoning yeah <laughs> hey gotta put a little lowry on it you know it used to be a local uh on the local college uh, tv station here there used to be a, a a black gentleman that had a little cooking show and he was always like i put a little lowry's on it. everything you could get lowry's on it and i was like 
that seems a little much. But after I got to know Mike Lowry's seasoning, I'm like, you know what? I, I really do use it on a lot of stuff. Now it's, this is now a Lowry seasoning salt appreciation podcast. <laughs> yes, I, and no free shout outs. I got to quit doing that. Um, yeah, we can we but, can bleep that out, right? Yeah, we'll just just put air horns over all that. I call it cooking in broth. A lot of times people just use water. I prefer a chicken broth on mine, but you're not going to be wrong about putting it in water. You're just going to have to add a little more seasoning or something to add umame. And then from there on, it's just kind of how you like it. You know, it's my, I'll, I, I do like to put a little dash of soy sauce in there sometimes, which is a kind of a chef secret that you, if you put a little bit of soy sauce, it's not going to make it taste like soy sauce. It's just going to add umame, which is that, and if you don't know what umame is, it's that kind of feel that just that flavor that you can't describe, right? They're sweet, salty, bitter, and what's what's the rest? Sweet, salty, bitter. Uh, sweet, salty, bitter, sour, and sour. Salty. Yeah, there we go. So we said and salty. Um, umami I'm is this. the fifth one, right? And it's a kind of a recent thing, but it's that kind of savory thing that you get from like a chicken wing or something. You know what I mean? It's just like a, that kind of indescribable yumminess that comes from meat and fat and deliciousness, right? Yeah, um, umami called, uh, umami is super important. Uh, uh, I think we're we're just starting in the West to understand how important it is. Uh, even though we've used those ingredients for a long time, the the big ones typically are uh, tomatoes, parmesan, and mushrooms. Those are the ones that we understand the most. Uh, yeah. But spoiler alert: uh, MSG, monosodium glutamate, that is basically distilled umami. Uh, and yeah. there's there's been a lot of hate against uh, MSG usage, and it is true. Like anything else, like anything else if you overuse it in your diet it will not be good for you uh but it 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 is definitely an additive that has its place uh but that's just to give you an idea uh i'm not getting on my soapbox about msg but if you know what that tastes like then you know kind of the chemical distillate of umami uh it's it's the mouth filler it it fills in the gaps between everything else uh uh, it, yeah, we were saying we like putting soy sauce in our greens for umami. Uh, another thing I like to throw in is a little bit of fish sauce, just a touch. Fish sauce is a great one. Yeah, and that's another one that too much of it, it's not going to taste good. But just a little bit, just add, you can't even taste it. It just adds something to it. And another ingredient I like like that that too much is is really bad, but just a little bit adds umami is Worcestershire. 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 As, you know, so there's a few different savory kind of sauces that you can keep in your fridge just to dash in your stuff to make it taste good. And you want to do that with your greens. Obviously, you can add some kind of salt, maybe some peppers in there, uh, black pepper, crushed red, something like that, or just a ton of hot sauce if you're Matt. <laughs> just, just break the top off the bottle like a beer bottle, you're, like you're about to get in a bar fight, you know. No, it's, it's like it's like I'm savoring a bottle of champagne. I just I just absolutely smash the top off and just throw it in there. <laughs> Uh, vinegar is a very common addition to greens, and a lot of times, if you're going to add vinegar, you're going to you're going to balance it with a little bit of sugar, a little sweetness, a little sugar or honey, and um, and I, I I do like doing that in mine. Uh, I think a champagne vinegar or a sherry vinegar is very good with greens, and but like I said, if you're going to put that in there, it's nice to have a balance, and it's really tri- like Matt was saying, it's really good to try to hit all of the flavor types in there, because and not all like. Oh, they all have to be even, right? You just want a little touch of it, right? It's like a French thing, right? When they went from the French make a, a perfume, they put a little bit of trash smell in there. They put something nasty in there, just a, just a touch. Not enough that you're going to smell it, but it makes the, the good stuff smell even sweeter, right? It makes it smell even better. And it'll bring out, like, you put salt in a chocolate chip cookie because it makes the chocolate and the sweetness come out even more. And that's just, it's called balance, and it's an important part of your cooking. Um, some other ways to eat collard greens and prepare them sauteed. Now, generally, you're going to want to use younger greens for this. You're, you're going to want to be a little bit more tender um, or you're going to have to saute them a little longer. You're just going to saute, you're going to chop them up, tear them up, saute them in oil. So they're, you know, what I'll do is I'll, I'll keep sauteing them till they look good. Take my, take a fork, stick it in there, pull it out, taste it. Is it chewy or does it kind of melt? Cause I want it more melty than chewy, right? It's good to have a little texture, but. You don't want it to, um, I like to saute mine with a little garlic shallot, red pepper flake, real simple, salt and pepper. So, when you do that, uh, you get to keep adding liquid too. And what, one thing we haven't really touched on yet, uh, is, uh, especially when we're talking about the broth method, uh, is the, the idea of pot liquor. 
Uh, yes. So we, when you when you have your finished product with greens, uh, the liquid you get a thing called pot liquor, and that is L I K K E R, uh, and that that's just the juice, that's the goodness. And when you have a really good one, you're gonna put it all over your plate, so you can sop it up with your bread or your cornbread or whatever else you got going on, and it, it can kind of bleed into everything else. So you get to use the the juice from the collard greens uh, almost as a gravy uh, for for your whole plate. And that's the most important part of it. If, from a nutritional aspect. If you're cooking it in a, by the broth method, that's the most important part to eat because as as you cook in the broth method, all the nutrients dissipate into the liquor. So drink it. Just drink that stuff up, man. Like like I'll put it on ice. Yeah, just just. Oh, it's real delicious. real talk if, though. If, uh, if you got some pot liquor, if you make some greens, if you can't use all your juice, and if you enjoy getting into a cup or two. Use that pot liquor in your next Bloody Mary, and Ooh. and you're welcome for that. <laughs> That's yeah, no, I like that because it's such a savory kind of thing mixed with that spicy tangy. Oh yeah, no, that's mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. um, I got I got to work, uh, or I'd be having one of those uh, right now. <laughs> another interesting way I've seen people use collard greens is as a wrap. Right, you take a nice green and you can make a sandwich out of it and use it as the wrap. And I thought that was really cool and a good way to get some like fresh green into your diet. Uh, very good for people who are on a low carb keto kind of thing. Um, I just thought yeah, that was I was really doing cool. a little bit of research. Uh, I was I was shocked to find that there's a lot of raw uses for greens because I'm I was always taught that you just have to cook them forever and ever. I was I was shocked yeah. that people are out there using them raw. Yeah, and that's a very Asian thing too to use it like a green leaf as a wrap or something like that as some sort of vessel to Asian and African cultures will both do that as a vessel to get the food from your plate to your mouth. Um, uh, like you're saying, raw. Uh, I've seen a lot of people have make collard green salad. Now, what you want to do with that is you want to marinate it in your dressing because the water in the dressing is going to help break down that collard green a little bit and make it a little less tough. How long of a marinade are we talking? I think you, do, you know, you do want a little bit of the crispness. That's part of the attractiveness of it. But I think you want to marinate it for at least 30 minutes. Uh, you don't want to over marinate because it'll just become a soggy mess though. And that's another one that I may marinate it for a little bit. Take my little fork out, try it. Mm. Is it, is it chewy still? Is it, is it where I want it? You know, um, yeah, I would marinate it in oil and vinegar. You can use any kind of salad dressing you want. Though. All salad dressings are going to have some sort of water in it, which is going to clog up those pores and going to make the lettuce wilt a little bit. Um, and you, when you're making your salad, you can make it how you want it. Add what you want. You know, If you want to make one with ranch, make it with ranch. If you want to try a Thai peanut dressing, do that. And then add ingredients that complement and add texture. Uh, I would like to put a tangy cheese on there, maybe a feta or something like that some kind of fruit, grapes, a dried fruit, maybe a dried apricot, something like that. Meat would be good. You know, if you have some, some ham hock that you boiled up, you know, you can pull it apart, take that out. You can use chopped up bacon. That was very popular on salads. I would uh, think you could use that. You could use uh, raw collard greens in the same neighborhood as a kale salad. You know, any, anything yeah. you might apply to kale, uh, go ahead and try it with collards. Yep. Uh, peppers, onions, nuts, seeds, cucumber. I mean, the, the sky's the limit on salads. But what I'm looking for when I'm looking for ingredients to add to a salad is I want things that complement the flavor of the lettuce and the dressing. And I want things that add texture, right? I don't want everything to be soft. I want some things to be crunchy, some things to be crispy. Oh, you know? man. C catch me out here figuring out my collard green Caesar salad with some cornbread croutons. Have a nice little southern southern Caesar. Ooh, I might be I might be I, might, I got to write that down. I might be working on that. Yes. Let's, oh, man. I, I'm going to try that, too. A collard green Caesar because a Caesar dressing is so perfect for those hearty greens because the Caesar really uh, I don't want to say it can overpower, but it's got it's so strong in its own thing that it can balance out the bitterness very, very well. You'd see a lot of kale Caesars because of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, very popular ingredient on restaurant menus these days is a nice kale Caesar salad. Um, another great way to prepare and eat collard greens is in soups, right? Because you're still, you're doing that kind of stewing kind of process with it and it breaks it down and 
you're going to get all those nutrients in the broth of the soup. So it's, it makes it, the soup's really healthy for you. Uh, obviously, I black love eye greens pea. in a soup, man. Love yeah. greens in a soup. Obviously black eyed pea and collard green soup is a very famous soup in the South, especially to eat on new year's day, because as we spoke of earlier, it's believed to provide you with wealth and prosperity for the coming year. Hop and John, baby. Hop and John's. Yep. That's what it's called. Uh, but another really cool soup that I saw that I'm going to, make i think sometime soon is called caldo verde which is a portuguese soup caldo verde in portuguese means warm green right does that sound perfect for a nice cold winter day warm green right yes please thank you i'll have some warm green no i'm definitely um, firing up some warm green on a cold winter day pretty simple soup onion potato collards chorizo garlic chicken stock boom and I like all those ingredients. That sounds great to me, especially with the chorizo in there. I, you know, because we talked a lot about the seasoning meats earlier, but chorizo is one that's going to add a little bit of spiciness. It's got a lot of fat in it, so it's really going to add that umami to the whole soup. And oh, it's yeah. just a great sausage that I think is underutilized in America. Yeah, particularly a uh, we're, we're all familiar with the uh, loose chorizo that you'd find in a taco or something like that. But I think for application to greens, uh, if you can find some cured Spanish chorizo, uh, you can eat it raw and it's delicious, or you can throw it in that pan and all of that that cured, uh, almost fermented flavored fat is going to leach out into your greens. Uh, so Spanish chorizo would be an excellent option there. Are there any other seasoning meats that you would think of to put in a collard green? Uh, you had a, you said smoked turkey. I want to start, shout out particularly turkey neck. Uh, it's it's an ingredient that you're not going to eat on its own, but it's perfect for, for putting into a pot, putting into a stew, a soup, a greens. Uh, yeah, smoked turkey neck. And honestly, uh, a lot of, uh, we've there's a couple of local uh, butchers where you can just buy smoked turkey necks. Uh, you know, because you're going to smoke a whole turkey, you're not going to sell the neck. So it's got to come from somewhere. Smoked is important because that smokiness really adds a level of the, to the a level of flavor to the dish that is hard to recreate without at using liquid smoke, which is just literally concentrated smoke. I've learned recently, which is kind of neat, but at the same time, it just doesn't taste the same, does it? No, it man, almost... it's invasive. It's it, liquid smoke occupies the same space as truffle oil for me. Like once you use it, that's what that whole dish is about. Like th th there's no balance anymore. You got to be very delicate with it. You know, just just a touch, right? I will I will sniff that shit out so fast. If I, if I taste the dish with that, oh man, I I'll track it immediately, and I will, I will not be happy. <laughs> a lot of people will just use just regular bacon, Oscar Mayer bacon in their greens. It's kind of the easy way to do it, and you know it does have that umami and the fat and everything. That it it'll be fine, I think. But you're you're really gonna be well served to use a ham hock, I think. That smoked ham hock, I think, is it's probably my favorite. I like to boil the ham hock for a little bit uh, first, so that by the time it's by the time the greens are done, the ham hock like, ham hock is completely broken down, and I can dispense that meat into the thing and pull into the broth and pull out the bone. Yeah, that's just my personal uh, thing, and that's the thing about greens is it's it's such a per pervasive thing in the South, and it's the the recipes are generational. Um, and in black families even longer than white families here because we didn't start eating them until after the civil war really but um, it's something that's handed down generational to generation to generation and everybody has their own way of preparing them and that's kind of what makes it so cool down here is that the way that my family makes their greens when i go to someone else's house and they have their family's green recipe it's going to be completely different but i'm going to i'm going to promise you it's going to be delicious right oh, yeah. and um, that's part of the fun of cooking and the joy of cooking, I think is, you know, in a lot of ways, it's a lot like gardening and that there's a lot of different ways to get a great result. And it's fun to just learn the different ways that people prepare food and the way that they enjoy their food. Matt, is there anything else you'd like to add about collard greens today? Oh man. Uh, give, give, give me, give me some. Uh, that's all I'll say. So some like just send them. Send me loose loose bags of collard greens. I'm not going to dox myself, but uh, if you know how to find me, just send me send me collard greens. It's one of my favorite things in the world. I, I was so stoked to to talk about these. I think we I think we hit all the good points. Um, yeah, I'm I'm pretty happy about it. Uh, 
I, I now I just need to eat them as soon as possible. I, I, I got hungry. <laughs> yeah, and I just want to give a special thanks to all everybody who listened and watched today, and especially those of you who took the time to comment in our comment box. Uh, we really, really appreciate you guys. Um, Allison, one grind. I'm so bad at pronouncing these. Uh, Dad Hat Wrestling. I can I can definitely pronounce that one. Thank you, Dad Hat. Thank you, Sledge. It real good. Um, we appreciate all you guys for coming out and participating. Absolutely. Uh, as always, we would like for you guys to show us your dirt. If you have a delicious meal that you have prepared or that you have eaten somewhere, please take a picture of it and send it to us with the hashtag show us your dirt. Show your, I think it's, yeah, show us your dirt and send it to us on Twitter at the Dirty Belly, on Instagram at the Dirty Belly, or on Facebook, the Dirty Belly Show. Follow us, like us. Subscribe, whatever you want to do is fine. Show but show we'll Jeff your dirt. I want to see your belly. Show, show me them bellies. If you if you if you just like and subscribe and you don't show us your dirt, I will not like you as much as somebody who does not like and subscribe, but does show us their dirt. Okay, that's what I want to see. I want to see the dirt. Okay, I love people and what they eat, and that's what I want to see. All right. Um, shout outs to our next two shows on Rivet City Radio, T and Hot. Trivia night. <laughs> yeah, yo, real quick. Uh, April 6th from 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock, we're going to be going live with, uh, I believe, with a couple of our producers. And uh, we're just going to cut loose and do some trivia. I, I can't wait. It's going to be so much fun. Oh, I can wait. I'm so bad at trivia. This is going to be this is going to be embarrassing. If you want to see a grown man embarrassed about how he has no knowledge about anything, uh, Tune in. It'll be fun. I'll be and right there so, with you, bud. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't call myself a smart man, but I'll be there. <laughs> so with that, I'd like to say thank you, Hungry Homies, for joining us today on our journey of learning more about the food we eat. Bruh, bruh. Peace out, y'all. Thank you.